Well, everybody, welcome to Thursday. It's good to see you all. Hello, Barbara. Um, so today we're going to be looking at the colors of Jason Yeo. Jason, Jason is from uh, Malaysia. He's a brand ambassador. Um, it'll be very interesting to see him tomorrow. Um, boy, the colors look like a mix of some brights and quite a few um, earth colors. That'd be kind of uh, interesting to see. Um, last week, so I think Barbara asked me about uh, the show last week. The last week was in Orlando, and it was a um, National Art Materials Trade Association. Um, first one in over two years. And although there wasn't a lot of new product, probably one of the most best things, and probably everybody had a smile for is you were able to see people you haven't seen for two years. So it was wonderful to get out. It was wonderful to see people that I've missed for a long, long time. Um, looking for that, uh, looking forward to that in Bologna as well. Um, not, not a lot of new product. Uh, the association now has the uh, Hobby Industry, Hobby International Association is part of it. Um, it's probably one third the size because still people are very um, fearful of large groups, um, kind of understandable. Um, so it was very small size, but full of a lot of friends. And it was just enjoyable seeing everybody. Um, so quite nice. The weather was fantastic for those of you that live in Florida. That's what great weather. I mean, here I'm in uh, Washington and it's in the garage. You can hear my heater behind me kicking in. Um, it's not so cold, but it's like only 50 degrees. Um, but then when it gets really hot, then you know we complain about the, the, the heat here. And when it gets cold, we complain about the cold. So probably never quite right here. Um, so we're gonna look at colors today. The one thing I did, uh, here at the um, show, and it made sense to me, um, was about the, the sticks. And you know, when, when looking back at it, I made the sticks because it was a pan in your hand. You know, you could hold it, you could paint with it, et cetera. And what I heard from a lot of the retailers, well, my customer picks it up and they don't know how to draw with it. And I never made it to draw with. It was really for the watercolors to have a pen in their hand. And if they wanted to draw with it, that was fine, but they could paint with it. And looking back, I probably should have made it into a big triangle or, a, or an oval, something that would have taken the thing of, well, if I hold this, especially with tactile people, because it makes sense. You hold it, you figure you want to draw with it. So I, what I thought I'd do is um, next week, I'm going to uh, um, invite artists. Um, any of you can come along as well. Um, so Giovanni, Gabriel, probably 10 to 12 artists over the next several weeks, just to show how they paint with the sticks. Because one, they do really beautiful work. Um, and it's just to be able to drive home that it's a pen in your hand. It's, it's um, high capacity color in your hand. So with that, um, if you're on um, Facebook, then somebody will, I'll try to read your question or somebody will read your question. I see Anna's on there right now. Um, and then if you're on uh, Zoom, just go ahead and you can just unmute and ask a question if you wanna ask a question. All right, so with that, I'm gonna put this down so we can look at Jason's colors. I'm, I'm doing this from my garage uh, because I was in a um, convention with probably uh, several thousand people. I'm self-isolating for 10 days. Um, I set the rule up for my business so no one you know, infects other people. So I have to abide by it myself. So I'm doing this from my garage and that sound you'll hear every once in a while is the heater behind my head. Um, it tries to keep it a crisp 60 degrees in here. Okay, so Jason has um, several of the uh, transparent oxides. So one of them is a red oxide. Let me do all the oxides together here, I think. And then Gabriel and Giovanni will be doing them as well. Um, so let me find the yellow oxide. And as soon as that's red, this one is brown. Yellow. 
He has raw umber. I'll be interested to see what he paints tomorrow. John. Yes. Uh, with these oxides, do I assume they come from the same pigment family? Um, not necessarily. They can. So there are uh, several different oxides. That... The, so the families can be quite large. Um, the umbers and siennas um, can be quite large. Uh, oxide depends on what type of oxide it is and then how they're classified. Right. Do, do I mostly assume that they're what we call earth colors? One more time, please. Do I assume that they're mostly earth colors? Earth what? colors. Earth colors. Earth colors. You know, not necessarily, because a lot of, so it depends. So that's a yes, no question. Are they earth colors? Um, they can be, but then there's uh, ones that we buy from industry. They're used for industry and they have to be perfect. And if they're perfect, then they're going to be from, they're going to be um, synthetic. Right. right. So if industry wants it, and they don't want any type of other um, element in it, et cetera, for whatever reason, then it's going to be synthetic. Uh, yeah, but you can also, you know, they can also absolutely be found in the natural world. Um, mm -hmm. You know, French ochre, uh, Italian, you know, Pompeii, a lot of those are natural. So it can be both worlds. In, in contrast, there's synthetic red oxide in the, yeah. Well, oxide just means oxidation. So you can get oxides. I mean, every time you see rust, you're seeing oxide. When you're seeing um, um, copper and you see the, the green or the blue, it's, 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 it's an oxide. So there's lots of oxides in the natural world. It just depends whether they're being used or not used in industry. Why do the uh, oxidize? things is that some sort of way to bond the um, pigment why do things oxidize yeah because you're going through a chemical reaction and it could be changed from one form to another so right. you know, iron as it corrodes corroding is really just oxidizing for example yeah uh, so this first one is going to be transparent red oxide i'm not sure if you can see what i'm doing you can see I'm going to go up. God, that's really pregnancy. And turn the view to speaker. There we go. So this is the transparent red oxide, transparent red oxide. And you can see it in Johnny's as well, um, as well as Gabriel's, so transparent red oxide. I didn't want to get that on my screen. And the uh, next one is the transparent brown oxide. Uh, Gabriel or Johnny, can you, can you, um, or Giovanni, can you actually do some mixing? Um, so everybody can see what they what they look like when they're when they're mixed, if you would. Yeah, sure. Angela, your top yeah. camera's video is off. Is it? Yeah. Uh, 
That's the transparent yellow oxide. Okay, now Angela, thank you. Um, but it's in portrait. Yeah. Trying to fix Hello, it. Beth. Hello, Nancy. Hello, Cheryl. And Kathy. Hello, Hello everyone. Now okay. Yes. Okay, thank, thank you. you. This is wrong. John. Yes. Uh, do I assume that there's a, an alternative to each one of these colors with regards it not being transparent? I.e., one that's opaque. Um, you could probably, most likely, um, you would find semi opaque or semi transparent. Right. Alternatives. So an easy way to do this is either use the color chart or use the um, the spreadsheet that has all the information about the colors. It's online. You can actually see the different um, classifications and also their um, transparency or opacity. So it might be good to ask Jason tomorrow, tomorrow why he chooses transparent colors. Oh, I should have brought a so this is cat orange. Cat orange you. I brought a couple of colors that Jason's not using just to show you some alternatives. And this is pyro orange. So the cat orange is very bright. The pyro orange, I believe, is going to be even brighter. Yeah, pyros are really bright. Probably the reddest red that we have is the pyro red, which is part of Jason's colors here. There we go. So cad orange, and this is pyro orange. Nice washes, Gabriel. Um, John, pyrrole orange is fairly opaque, right? Um, it's going to be. It's going to. It should be semi-opaque. Okay. Make sure. Are you using pyrrol orange? I am using pyrrol orange right here, pyrrol orange. Yeah. Oh. So the pyrrol orange is it's a pigment orange 73, it's medium staining, it's non-granulating and it's semi-transparent. And the CAD, let me put it close to that. So the CAD, low staining, non-granulating, uh, semi-transparent, semi-opaque, semi-transparent. Okay, so there's the first six. Let me add this, go back here. So 
Is my camera in focus? Um, yes, it is, but it's not as crisp. The image not as crisp as few few weeks ago. Well, Carolyn, unless there's in. So now we do power orange. I'll send you a message in uh, Messenger, Angela. Yeah. In burnt orange. I think that does Jason use both the I know he uses ultramarine because that was the last thing that I picked. Did he also have French ultramarine on his? Yes. That's interesting. We'll have to ask him about that. He must have those super eyes that can see the difference between the, the red and the green. I'm always amazed about that. Black, let's do cad yellow. Okay. Better? Yeah. Yeah. Okay, it's a lot closer to that, Angela. Better? Yeah. Definitely better. Do any of you watching use the pyro red? Excuse me? I said, do any of you watching use the pyro red? Yes, John. Yeah. It's on my dot card. I love it. I believe I do have it, yeah. In my no. limited palette. I also there. love pyro red, John. Awesome. I used it recently to paint a car. Did you? What kind of car? Corvette. Oh, new or old? 1959. Oh, those are awesome cars. Yeah. I saw a video on the plane of the new the new Corvette. It's the um, it's the convertible, and how the top sucks back into the trunk. It's just it's pretty amazing. <laughs> We have at least two weeks out of the year that we can use convert convertibles here in Washington, and then the rest of the time it gets soaked. Likewise, here. Yeah. Same there? Yeah. So this is the pyro red, and this is the cornacron burnt orange. What does it have in that, John? The uh, burnt orange. I'll tell you. So the Quinn burnt orange is PO48, so pigment orange 48. Uh -huh. So it is a single pigment. Uh -huh. A single pigment, by the way, which is no longer made. Wow. Just on the subject of availability of materials, have you oh, found it a lot more challenging recently to get uh, the uh, raw materials and basic things to run your company? Uh, for us, you know, I, my, my career, when I started, 
was in IS, uh, information systems, computer systems. Right. And in computer systems, you live by the rule of contingency planning. Um, you assume everything is going to break. And so mm -hmm. what is your backup when it does? You don't, you, don't, you don't assume that things will last forever. So everything is mission critical. And I look at the same way when I look at the company. Um, if I don't have boxes, I can't be in business. If I don't have tubes, I can't be in business. If I don't have pigment, I can't be in business. So I look to go out to um, 15 years of on-site um, pigment. The minimum I would have would be five if it's something that is always readily available, um, but up to 15 years on the majority of everything. And the same thing when it comes to tubes, et cetera. I, in a business as a manufacturer, unless you're always going to change your item and change your pricing, um, it's very difficult to always try to get something which is new. Can't do that because um, the amount of time it takes to bring in a new color is, it just takes a really long time. So having the pigment is always in my best interest. That's why I drive my CPs crazy. Time? And they're artists and they always say, well, why do, you, why do you need that? Why do you need so much of that? I said, well, you know, continuity of color. There's an expectation that people buy the color, it matches the color that it was. Yes. Um, I think Barbara has a question. Okay, Barbara. I can't hear you, Barbara. There we go. Hi, John. So what do you do when like the pigment is no longer available in like the quinacridone burnt orange? So I've do you find a plan B that's close enough? So we or... have, so it would be the same thing that with the um, the quinacridone um, gold. Um, in 13 years, when I run out of pigment, because I bought 13 years worth, um, between <laughs> now and then, we will have uh, already developed a blend. We will have tested the blend, um, have it outside tested, okay. to make sure that it does what it's supposed to do. Um, so when the time comes, we will be able just to go over to that. Okay, cool. So here's another question. The sleep, do you have a lot, a big, stockpile of sleeping beauty turquoise i found out when i was in arizona that the mine was closed yeah the mine so somebody told me that my mineralogist told me the mine was closed somebody else said well the mine is open um it is it is certainly from my understanding closed and they're not mining the sleeping beauty because the mine um water came in and the amount of cost it takes to take the water out of a mine once it's been mm. submerged is just unbelievable in cost. So right. what I do, the, the, the mineral for me lasts forever. So I'm always, uh, Bruce goes out every single year. We're always working with miners. And when I find stuff, I just put it in 55 gallon drums because there's, there's no half-life to it. It'll last forever. Okay. Um, Happy to hear no. that. <laughs> More time, please. Oh. Yes. Uh, so from from concepting a, a colour to the point where you um, finally get a product out and ready for sale, how long does that take? So the biggest part of uh, there's two parts that are. There's, there's a couple of parts that take a long time. Um, one of them is to, to make sure that it has some type of meaning in the art world. Um, so Ron and I can make colors until we're blue in the face. I mean, it's what we do, it's what we can do, but it's really, does it add anything? Is it, is it anything special? Um, does one blue granulate and the other one not granulate? Is uh, one transparent and the other not transparent? So what's special about it? What would add to somebody's palette? So that's one piece. Then the second piece becomes the testing. So we have to send it out for testing. And not only do we have toxicologists in the USA, we have toxicologists outside the USA. And so it has to go through, and toxicology is a very, um, could be very long and labored process. Um, 
if it's a, a natural product, uh, it doesn't come from industry, then before we even send it to the toxicologist, we send it out to assay because assay said, you know, checks for over 40 different types of attributes of, um, of an element. So just lots of testing before it ever um, can go to the floor to be made. That being the case, probably um, it's about six months, six months to a year. So if we were making quinacridone gold or quinacridone burnt orange, we could make that in two weeks. But if we're starting new with something, it takes quite a long time. And then um, because I sell to distributors, um, they have to be willing to carry it. And then um, different uh, retail stores and or catalogs have different times they put their catalogs out. So there's, it's probably six months to a year. That's not bad for R and D, that though, is it? To to get a stable product out there, it's pretty good going. Uh, yeah, I mean, it depends, right? I mean, if it's a um, if it's a earth earth pigment, it's going to take a lot longer. Um, if it's a synthetic, it's going to take a lot less because you're, you know exactly what's in the synthetic, you know how it's gonna behave, it was made for industry. They're gonna give you a sheet of everything about it, you know, the temperature, um, fluctuations it has, the, everything, pretty much everything is known about it. Um, so here we have the Quinn, the Quinburn Orange, the Ultramarine and the French Ultramarine. So we're gonna ask Jason about that tomorrow. I'm gonna to ask Jason about that tomorrow. You can as well. Okay. So we put that down. That's actually quite a colorful palette as I look at it. Did you see that? You can actually see Giovanni's too, but it's actually quite colorful. Okay. Um, we don't. Longer, we no longer have a um, a catalog, Carolyn. So no more retail business. The last retail business uh, shut down in November, and that was the Seattle store, which was the last to be shut down. So no more catalogs. So John. Yes. Uh, throughout history, if there were a colour uh, that you would have loved to in, have invented or come up with, what colour would it have been? Actually, probably the boy, probably one of the ultramarines, because when you think about it, they have they've had huge impact. It's probably on every one of your palettes. Um, it was made to replace uh, lapis. Yeah, probably the ultramarine. Probably, and it's it's not the most. Um, complex color, but I think from my perspective, uh, quite beautiful and neat history. And the two teams that developed it, um, it wasn't easy for them to develop it. They went through a lot to do it. So I'd say the Ultramarines. Oh, yeah. Correct answer. <laughs> <laughs> I think, I think we all have a bit of ultramarine in us. So this is the lunar black. So you guys are good at this. I showed you color more of his recently. Um, but that's the lunar black. It has that awesome granulation. And this is the cad yellow. And you can see uh, Gabriel's mixes, you can see Giovanni doing uh, his side-by-sides. So I didn't tell, I think I might have shared this with you. I wasn't quite sure whether I did or not. Uh, we're going to come out with um, 
22 colors in gouache. And that'll be at the end of the year. So that's going to be probably the, the newest thing or a new medium, which is going to be kind of cool. <coughs> Sounds very cool. Will that be open stock or will you have sets? Good night, nice, John. But gouache. Hey, that means I could go back to using my gouache light. <laughs> Torch like crazy outside. Do we know the colors? Um, I, I have the colors. I will share those with you. I don't have them with me right here. Gab Gabrielle, there's a question from Lisa. Do you have any gold um, that you use today? She's particularly asking on the gold um, in the upper left. I'm not sure if this is the swatch that she's referring to. Are you asking me about uh, these here? Um, is there a gold on this on this swatch? No, right? Uh, I, so you know, I was thinking about that and uh, this uh, transparent yellow oxide, it kind of reminds me of a gold, um, not an iridescent gold, but uh, it definitely is a color that I would be interested in using. And then uh, we've got this raw sienna light. And I think that's per, that's a beautiful color that tends to be a warm yellow. Uh, so I I would you know uh, maybe cause an argument to say that's a gold, but it's definitely not lemon yellow. And uh, but yeah, like uh, in this uh, dot card, I would uh, consider those two. And then, of course, uh, we've got this wonderful, tasty uh, burnt scarlet. Um, but it's that's like that's really pushing it to say that that is gold. Did I did I answer the question? If you take the burnt scarlet all all the way watered down to the lightest hues, would it be yeah. golden? I agree. Yeah, like an Aztec gold. Uh, bismuth yellow with uh, uh, some kind of uh, red oxide or light orange. So this is cobalt blue. This is permanent orange. The permanent colors, permanent green, permanent orange were among, permanent red were among the first colors that we ever made. So he's, he's got three oranges and three blues, right? Um, this one's a cheat. I picked this one because I wanted to show you a different orange. Oh, okay, <laughs> the two oranges. <laughs> It's not a cheat. <laughs> so this is burnt umber. Paint Antarctica? Did you paint like the icebergs and things of that nature when you were on your trip? Yes. How did, yes. You, what did you use? What kind of colors did you use to accomplish that? Um, I used a lot of lunar blue. I used an ultramarine cobalt. Um, lavender was quite 
useful. Wow. Um, Sleeping Beauty turquoise um, with a lot of white. And um, I used um, Moon Glow. Um, there was black and purpley colors. It was just, I mean, it was changing constantly. That's too cool. <clears throat> so You've got to go. I had it scheduled about two years ago and then something happened. I had to cancel it. No, I had to do way more than that because that was COVID time, probably four years ago. Right. Um, yeah, it was on my list for a long time. And then finally I said, during COVID, I said to my husband, Viking is, Viking has a tour. They're taking on their new ship. And we signed up like eight months in advance or six months in advance. Oh, that's too awesome. So I'm really glad. John, there's a question yes. from Anna. Uh, um, I know you've answered this before, but uh, she wants to know the difference between our ultramarine and French ultramarine. Sure. So the difference between the two. So this is the ultramarine and this is the French ultramarine. And the difference is particle size. Um, they're both PB29, pigment blue number 29. And the particle, say, for the French is this big. And the particle for the ultramarine is that big. So when light hits the larger particle, it moves or shifts toward the warm or the red. When light hits the smaller particle, it moves or shifts toward the cool or the green. So it's all about particle size. Um, when we look at the um, uh, quinacridones, quinacridone means five rings, it's all about chemistry and where the alpha and beta particles are on the molecule and how those, where, where they're located gives the shift of color for the quinacridones. That's why the quin red, the quin rose, the quin violet are all PV19, pigment violet 19, but they have all different shades and that's from a chemistry side. John? Yes. Is that the same with phalo as what you've just mentioned no. for ultramarine? No, it's not. Um, phalos are, they're, they're, I think they're quite fabulous in, in many aspects, but it's all from, uh, they're made, they are made for industry and they're made for a particular purpose. And so the whole chemistry behind them is to meet the needs of whatever company um, or client, if you will, I uh, wanted it that way. So what, last time I was looked, I think it was, I, I don't know which phthalo it was, but it was used in the thousands of tons, thousands of tons. It's just when you really? think about that, it's just mind blowing that, that a pigment can be used in that quantity. With, with regard to um, whether it's, a, a green shade of phalo blue or a red shade of phalo blue. It's, it's you just know what you just mentioned about ultramarine and the particles making it a different shade. So it depends on how it depends on how it's made. If if you have so with a three-roll mill, we can bring down the particle size. We can make French ultramarine uh, into ultramarine because we can bring the, the rolls through, through the computer so very, very close that we can change the size of the particle. When something's chemically done, you really can't, you really can't, it's not about the size of the particle. So you're not going to be able to change it. And you can, you can squeeze the quinacridones, but you're not gonna be able to put the alpha and beta particles on different parts of the chain just because you make it smaller. It, it kind of, it is what it is. So it's pretty, pretty fabulous when you think about the complexities of the things that we're using. And you know, whether it's industry, you know, car industry or whatever industry or for, for, for you as artists, all, we're all doing the same thing. We're pushing light 
because it's all about light and it's all about how you push light and the beauty that you get out of that. And kind of that's the world that we see all the time is this beautiful world um, that we can control by how light interfaces with what we're doing. It's pretty neat. So this is the, oh, I guess this one anyway, this is going to be the green appetite. And then there is the olive green. And then this one right here is the sap green. So lots of greens. So I'm pretty sure, I know that on um, Jason's, he has the green appetite and he has the sap green. Does he have the olive, Gabriel? I'm thinking that, I'm not quite sure if I, I picked up the olive just to show you or it's on his list. Yes, he has the olive as well. Okay. Olive green. Okay, awesome. Yes. I love olive. I love olives. Oh, I love Angela. That's beautiful, Angela. Oh my God. Thank you. Gorgeous. Oh yeah. Is that the lunar black? Lunar black, yes. Yeah. And the, the yellow is the cadmium yellow light. Stunning. So I looked back on the chat and uh, the color, or the question was, what was the color that I was using uh, that looked goldish? So that was the transparent yellow oxide, which I did another uh, paint out here. And then uh, we have the raw sienna light over here. And then we have over here, I uh, combined the uh, Quinn Burnt Scarlet with the Transparent Yellow Oxide, and I got really thinned it out, and we got this really cool, uh, like, uh, Aztec gold. And it's pretty Beautiful. nice. Great question. Thank you so much. This last one is a cerulean blue. Yeah. Now, did you do the greens now, John? Yeah, the greens are right here. They're the green appetite. Ah, the appetite, yes. Green, and this is the sap green. Green appetite, I love that color. John, we have a question from Caroline. From, uh, this is from Facebook. So do we use an additive for anti-mold in our watercolors? Yes. yes. Yeah, I have a question, John. Yes. What's the question? Uh, my question is, I read the uh, story on the website about the serpentine mine in um, Australia. Oh, no, Tasmania, Tasmania. A place that I really would like to go, actually. Um, and there were these little purple things, um, purple minerals in with a green serpentine. Yes. Yep. Are those commercially viable? Mm, they're, they're, they're just super minute. Um, oh. Yeah, I mean, they're just super, super, I don't know if you can see my finger. Anyway, they're just super, super small. Um, you can see them with your eye, but they're really, really small. They were Tasmania, so interesting. Tasmania was awesome. I met with the miner, it's an, op it's an open mine. Um, and he does it by himself. And it was just, my shoes were green from the green appetite I was walking on. It was just, it was awesome. It was really, really awesome. It's a gorgeous place, Tasmania. I hear you can hike the Northern part of it across. I think you could, yeah, uh, hike most of it. Barbara, let's go get some green shoes going. <laughs> So I like that. That, do you also create acrylic wash? No, no, um, I don't then. I'm gonna make, uh, it'll be a uh, watercolor wash. Long time ago, I used to make, um, make made acrylics. John, did you buy 15 years worth of the um, serpentine? The serpentine, I have at least that much. 
because I have it as um, uh, in, in 55 gallon drums. Right. <laughs> I have a serpentine uh, necklace, Heishi necklace made by the Navajo that I bought many, many years ago in Arizona. And I was always thinking it was a, an American stone because the Navajo used it. So yeah, it is. So a lot of the minerals, it's a really good point. A lot of the minerals um, are indigenous to the U.S. and indigenous to other continents. Because at one time, they go back in history, eons ago, we were just one big landmass. And that landmass right. you know, broken apart over time. So you can right. find you know, the same minerals, but just not in the same quantities. Um, pretty much Chile and Afghanistan have the most amount of the lapis. You can find blue, um, blue apatite in California. You can find jade in different parts of DC, but you can find it in other places as well. Um, yeah, so it's it's, it's kind of, it's very interesting. So you probably did get it from, um, it probably was from the, the U.S. somewhere. It also showed trade, trading uh, routes. Uh-huh. Interesting. John? Um. I mean, that's one of the things about the minerals is because many of them are semi-precious, it's trying to get, we try to get ones that have been broken, um, where they've made plates and there's bits and pieces they don't need because bits and pieces work fine for me. I don't, I don't need, you know, beautiful, massive things. Um, so it's, 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 I kind of like it because we can use up a hundred percent of the piece. Someone's making art, they'll have chips they don't need. Instead of getting rid of them, we take them and we can use those to, to make pigment and then make paint. Mm -hmm. John. Yes. Uh, I'm fortunate enough to uh, live near a place called the uh, Peak District National Park in England. Uh, oh. and in there, uh, they've got a, a place called the Blue John Mines. And uh, if you're ever in the north of England, you ought to go and have a, uh, a look down there because that's got tons of minerals and stuff that they get out of it. Some that are individual to that particular mountain. Very cool. It, it's interesting, I was showing the minerals at this um, last show, and whether I show them in Germany or in China or in, anywhere, um, it's, it's usually mm, a separation of maybe two or three people, maybe four people. So somebody will have a father or a mother or a sister or a brother or a cousin, but somebody somewhere has collected minerals, has enjoyed minerals, but it's, it doesn't take, it's almost everybody stops and looks, well, I'm not a painter, but you know, so-and-so collected this one. Then they'll bring their friends over and say, this is what they collected. They collected, you know, these barrels or that. So it's, it's pretty interesting. Oh, that's neat, Giovanni. It was a major hobby, weren't it, that, at one time of day? He'd always have a cabinet Beautiful full of Giovanni. rocks. You know, my mother is Giovanni. I put a spotlight Geo's mix. No, we so also Angela. have Angela's and Anna Marie's. Okay. Also, yeah. Johnny's, I love Johnny's mixes, all those beautiful and Gabriel's as well. Mm -hmm. um, They're all looking very nice. I like the way it's and marks going. too. We're gonna add marks there. Oh. All right, Mark. Great. Mm. Oh, I, I like the blue the mix. Mark. With what did you uh, mix the blue one, Mark? With which uh, color did you mix the, the second one. one from from your side? The the second. Yeah, that one. That's ultramarine and um, uh, cat orange hue. Looks nice. That's by oh, yeah. I like I like the second one. Yeah, this one, it looks far more yeah. spectacular um, yeah. in real life. That's uh, Pyrrol Red and the, I uh, agree for that as well. the, the brown, brown oxide. Transparent yeah. brown. Transparent brown oxide. Mixes really well. From next week, I'm going to start doing brown. these mixes too. Yeah. Are you going to accept me in the group or not? <laughs> <laughs> sure. <laughs> Nice, beautiful. All of you guys did really beautiful, inspiring mixes. 
And Ida also mix. has unique mixes. You want to share um, clo closer to the camera, Anna? There. That's pretty cool. You're on mute, Anna. You're still on mute. There. It doesn't help us to talk about them then. <laughs> uh, I've gone through the colors of Jason's cards that I own, and here's green appetite with raw sienna with a touch of lunar black, going down with cobalt, ultramarine, and cobalt right, cobalt right at the bottom, and spritzing it to try to get the color to move and flow. Here I had a lot more quin burnt orange and the cadmium yellow medium hue, cerulean cobalt, ultramarine. And I don't have olive green, so I used rich green gold instead, playing with a little bit of lunar. Anna, you are, you are so close. Anna, you are so close to finish two beautiful abstract paintings. <laughs> I just need to frame them. Yeah, beautiful mixes. Thanks. Thank you, Anna. Oh, I love, I love this one, Giovanni. Green appetite and red oxide transparent. Such I a like nice that generation. too. Looking nice on that paper. What paper is it? Is it Fabriano? Rough. Yeah, it seems like Fabriano rough. Is it Giovanni? Paper. You find a ticker. Yeah, turn yes, then. Gio, is it is it Fabriano Rafa? Yeah. Beautiful. Mm -hmm. Thank you. You're welcome. We also have Johnny's unique mixes. Yeah, beautiful ones. Yeah. Really nice ones, Johnny. I really like yeah. this one with the cut yeah. orange and lunar black. Yeah. So simple and it's so beautiful. Also the right one. Yeah, yeah it's, it's like uh, we have orange violet. with cobalt violet. Yeah, exactly. Beautiful. I particularly like the clash of that red and blue. Yeah. It's almost as though they're like battling one another. Yeah, uh, it's pyro red and cobalt blue, and it yeah. looks like it's kind cool. of an elephant here. Uh, from <laughs> yeah. The, uh, <laughs> Is that over one of giraffe? <laughs> Johnny, I also like the ultramarine blue with the lunar black. I think you mixed the, the one. Yeah, okay. this one. Is it this ultramarine? Is raw amber with ultramarine. Raw amber, nice. Can you yeah. can you get it more closer just to see the structure? It's beautiful. Mm -hmm. And this one on bottom, it's a mix of two colors. Yeah. Oh, nice. Very nice. Very it's nice, beautiful. Johnny. I can see yeah. that in the distant Thank forest. You. That's a great job. And Tim, we're going to share it again on our socials. Okay. Good job, Oh, that's really nice, Gabriel. Beautiful, Gabriel. Yeah. Look at those brush strokes. I like. Oh, this is nice. The, the green one. With the... Oh, wow, that blue is really blue. So beautiful. I think I'm going to play with more with these oxide. This is beautiful, really. I love I love these two mixes. Gotta play. This is a great instead of opening your phone and getting on there and checking your email when you get up in the morning, just do this. Just play with mixing. That's pretty nice too. <laughs> no, yes. We also have Angela. Yeah. Us. Oh yeah, Angela's. Oh, Angela's are just stunning. Yeah. Oh, wow. That beautiful granulation with wow. yellow. It's so beautiful with green, huh? It's green. Very expressive. Yeah, green. Oh, no. Luna black and, Luna black. and yellow. Oh, beautiful. What are you doing with the green? 
And the green is appetite. All appetite? Mm. Uh, and sub-green. Here there is sub-green and here there is appetite. Very cool. Cut them out and turn them into an artist's um, trading card. <laughs> yes. <laughs> and here there is um, the, the purple, whatever it's called, the purple. Oops. Oh, I was off. Oh, we lost her. Again? How did you do this mix, Angela? <sighs> Yeah. Oh, this is that, the, uh, is that that is the purple. What purple is this? Uh, violet. I think it's cobalt a, violet. Cobalt violet, yes. And this is the yellow, the cadmium yellow light, and uh, and orange probably. Wow. Here is the the yellow, the cobalt yellow light plus the raw sienna. Rosina, is it? Yes, Rosina. And here the pyro red. And this is orange. The one at the bottom is orange, pyro orange, and hematite. And these are the three blues the cerulean, the cobalt, and the ultramarine. But the ultramarine was with the stick, and maybe I used too little. Very cool. I like that green a Such lot. A steady hand to get those tight. Rectangles. Yeah. <laughs> but the granulation of the appetite is amazing, huh? Yeah. It's amazing, yes. I have an appetite for painting now. <laughs> <laughs> and Angela, what, what paper are you using on that? Uh, that is um, a Arsh um, cold pressed. Is it rough? Or no, oh, no, cold pressed, cold pressed. Uh, small, not rough, but uh, thin. Uh, what do you call it? Cold pressed. Cold pressed. Thin mm -hmm. grain. Small yeah. grain. Mm -hmm. Cool. We have we have a guest in our um, in Facebook join Christine, who finds our swatching activity fun, so she's joining. She's been doing mixing too. That's oh, that's it. good. Great. I like yeah. Caroline's where her students are requesting the series. More, the more, the merrier. Yeah. Awesome. Well, thank you all for joining today. Tomorrow we'll watch um, Jason and how he uses the colors, which would be pretty fantastic. So over the next cu couple of weeks, uh, I think we'll do a lot more playing with the sticks, uh, just so we can see how those work. They're, they're, they're very interesting because they're just such a high, high pigment load. So um, that'll be interesting. We'll do mixes. The mixes are, are really beautiful. The guys did a phenomenal job on your mixes. Anna, thank you. Gabriel, Mark, um, Johnny, Giovanni, thank you all for doing that. It was fantastic. Thank you all for joining us. You can't wait to start seeing some of you in person. Um, I think the time is coming. I'll see you all tomorrow. Thank you so much. Bye. Bye. Thank you. Bye, everyone. Bye, Bye all. Bye. Bye.